These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. The year is 1115 BCE, and Asheresh Ishi has passed away, leaving the throne of Assyria to Tiglath-Pileser I. Now, Tiglath-Pileser is another biblical Hebrew name, which was first applied not to him, but to his successor a few centuries from now. But, like Nebuchadnezzar, We'll be using the biblical names because those are more common in English. His actual name was Tekulti Apil Ashara, whose name means my trust is in the son of Ashara, because of course the son of the god Ashara was the god Asher, patron of the city of Asher and the Assyrian Empire as a whole. That Assyrian Empire is not looking terribly imperial at the moment, but don't worry, we're at a brief period of flourishing for both the northern and southern Mesopotamian kingdoms. In fact, Tiglath-Pileser is about to do so much and, crucially, record so much of what he's doing that some modern scholars from a previous generation considered him to be the beginning of true history. Now, we have a good hundred episodes behind us to say that this is not literally the beginning of history. As far as we can tell, if we want to get real technical about it, there doesn't seem to be very much that Tiglef Pileser did, which you can't at least make a case for someone else having done before him. But there is a sense in which Tiglef Pileser does represent a beginning of sorts. A lot of the patterns of Assyrian kingship, which were building up in previous centuries, are going to continue taking shape in this reign. The violent propaganda and the extensive historical annals are particularly characteristic of Assyrian rulers going forward. And just from the general arc of history, there is a reason why a number of Assyrian histories begin right here in 1115 or 1114. But it's no use telling you about his broad historical significance without actually saying what he did, which is a lot. Now, when he takes the throne, Nebuchadnezzar has been king down in Babylon for some 10 or 15 years. Outside of the controlled regions of Mesopotamia, the rest of the Near East looks like a Mad Max movie, with roving bands of migratory groups having been kicked out of their homes, moving until they can bully someone to take their land, thus sending those groups out to migrate until they find someone they can bully. In fact, that outside context makes for something of a dispute in how Tiglath-Pileser is portrayed in history. Some say that the Assyrian Empire still holds on, very loosely, to a wide expanse of Upper Mesopotamia, and that pretty much all of these conquests that Tiglath-Pileser is about to boast of are not in fact conquests, but defensive actions to preserve the borders he thinks he has. Another perspective says that only the very core of the Assyrian heartland, the Tigris River around Asher and a few nearby cities, were actually under Assyrian control at the dawn of 1115, and tiglath pileser is actually going to go out and reconquer all these once lost territories, or at least some of these once lost territories. Like most things, I suspect the answer is somewhere in between the two. After all, how loose can loose control be before it isn't actually control at all? We know from previous kings that some pretty distant regions still claimed fealty and at least sent some amount of tribute. But we also know that some pretty key nearby regions don't appear in these records, either because the records are incomplete or because belonging to the Assyrian Empire was seen as more of an optional thing by this point. Of course, the key difference between the two pictures is whether you think the Assyrian territory is about to be reconstituted primarily by military force applied to places which had fallen out of the empire, or by domestic efforts by the king to establish control over regions that were already his.
Again, undoubtedly both were occurring, but the only thing this king is going to boast about is his military actions. And so we have a very one-sided picture, which historians struggle to balance out with other evidence. Anyway, right at the start of Tiglath-Pileser's reign, there's a problem. Up north, in the mountains above Mesopotamia, the Mushki have moved in. Now, these guys may have a mention in the biblical book of Genesis as the Meshech, and they may be related to a tribe in Georgia in the Caucasus Mountains with a similar name. But originally they come from northern Anatolia, or perhaps somewhere even further away from that. We never hear about them from the Hittites, at least not any, under any recognizable name, but they seem to have been one of the groups, along with the Kaskins, who participated in the final sack of the Hittite heartland. From there, they moved along the mountains, out of what would today be eastern Turkey, into the region around Lake Van, up in Greater Armenia. And this last bit was the problem, because with their move into that land, they displaced the people of Alzi and Purukuzi, who had once been Assyrian vassals. Now, to be clear, it isn't certain at all if the Alzi and Purukuzi were Assyrian vassals at the time the Mushki kicked them out, and in fact, it's quite possible that they had been lapsed vassals for quite some time. But the fact that Anyone who had ever been conquered by any Assyrian king ever was under threat was plenty of cause for war as far as Tiglath-Pileser was concerned. And so he gathered up chariots and infantry and marched north through some incredibly difficult terrain, often rising four to 5,000 feet above sea level. And remember, Asher itself is only like 600 feet above sea level to start with. So this is not an easy march. We don't know how many men the Assyrians mustered here. Thirty chariots are mentioned, but no sense of infantry. But the enemy was 20,000 men split among five kings. Now, if the five kings were working together, this would have been a terribly difficult campaign, but it's likely he attacked five different related groups all in the same region. And with the defeat of the Mushki, we get something that's going to become a trademark of later Assyrian chronicles, and I, I can't help but read it to you in full. From Tiglath-Pileser's record of his first five years, he writes, With their 20,000 warriors and their five kings, I fought in the land of Kutmuhi, and I defeated them. The corpses of their warriors I hurled down in the destructive battle like the storm god. Their blood I caused to flow in the valleys and on the high places of the mountains. I cut off their heads, and outside their cities, like heaps of grain, I piled them up. Their spoil, their goods, their possessions in countless number I brought out. I carried off 6,000 men, the remainder of their troops, who had fled from before my weapons and had embraced my feet, and I counted them as inhabitants of my land. Now we're going to have occasion to talk about every part of this in detail as it gets repeated over and over in future conquests. But let's just pause and note that this sort of rule warfare is extremely brutal. The killing itself is probably no different from any other Near Eastern or really any war at all in the ancient world. The key difference here is one of, we could say, presentation. Making piles of heads from slaughtered victims, let's be real, that doesn't actually hurt the dead people all that much. After all, they're already dead. What it's actually doing is saving a number of lives, both of invading soldiers and citizens in the besieged city. And in fact, we don't hear about anything aside from possessions being taken and the remaining soldiers being relocated, not even enslaved, which frankly is pretty gentle as a non-resisting city should expect. Now, morally, the Assyrians are going to be reviled by later generations as astonishingly brutal. But from a pragmatic standpoint, 
we need to keep in our minds right at the outset that these showy tactics are part and parcel of Assyrian success. And as much a propaganda that keeps the empire in power as it is a direct way to break resistance. And if you weren't already aware, we're going to be seeing a lot of this sort of thing over the next few centuries as Assyria violently rises to dominate in blood the entire Near East. Anyway, after beating up on the Mushki, he went around the rest of the Kutmuhi region and beat up some other smaller entities who are described as having been disloyal. Whether or not they knew they owed taxes to Assyria is beside the point. If Tiglath-Pileser thinks you owe taxes, he's going to come and collect. This victory is described more succinctly. I burned their cities, I devastated them, I destroyed them. But not completely, because a large number are able to flee the region to the nearby city of Shereshi on the Tigris River, way far north of Asher. It isn't clear if Tiglath-Pileser has any problem with Shereshe before, but he certainly does now. Pushing through the mountains, he apparently was forced to excavate a roadway large enough for his army and chariots, meaning that Tiglath-Pileser will literally dig his way through mountains to make you pay your taxes. Now, when he got there, an allied force had also arrived to reinforce this mountain fastness, but none of it was any good, because they also ended up with bodies on top of the mountain and blood in the Tigris River below. More burning, more devastation, more destruction ensues, and then they can move on to the city of Uratanash. Now, let's be honest. If the vision of tiglath pileser's tide of murder carving its way through the mountains doesn't at least worry you a little bit, well, then you're not visualizing well enough. The king of Urantanash, however, could visualize just fine and had heard about the previous cities on this campaign. As soon as the Assyrians enter his land, he runs out to them, prostrates himself before the king, and begs to be vassalized. Following close behind are a whole bunch of large copper and bronze objects and 120 slaves, as well as a bunch of livestock. All this Tiglath-Pileser receives as his due. The king then says, I pardoned him and spared his life. The heavy yoke of my rule I laid upon him for future days. So basically, when the Assyrian army comes knocking, your choices are a heavy yoke or utter destruction, and most will beg for the former. This is going to be a recurring theme. One thing to note is that we don't actually have any real sense of what this conquering army looks like. In a few generations, there's going to be a major reform of the Assyrian military that will transform it from a terrifying legion of death to an unstoppable terrifying legion of death. However, what it looks like right now is hard to say. It clearly had chariots and infantry, and was likely an evolution of the late Bronze Age systems of warfare that we've mentioned previously on the show. But honestly, we don't know as much about the infantry side of things for late Bronze Age Mesopotamia as we would like, and most of our knowledge there is either analogizing from Middle Bronze Age information or generalizing from what the chariots and infantry of other nations looked like. To go from that fuzzy picture into the early Iron Age where there are Decent suggestions that the face of warfare may have changed radically, at least in Anatolia and the Levant, and this leaves us with uncertainty piled atop uncertainty. That said, even if we're lacking details at this early stage in the game, we're going to hear so much about the Assyrian military machine before we reach the Neo-Babylonian Empire that I guarantee you will be exhausted from the bloodletting. Just think of how much worse it was for the people who had to live through it.
Anyway, Tiglath Palacer's year of murder has yet to conclude. The next stop on his Whirlwind Mountain tour is the land of Mildish, sometimes read as Ishdish. Unfortunately, the people of Mildish or Ishdish are haughty and not submissive and they have a silly name. And even worse, their mountains are more extreme than any Tiglath Pileser has yet faced. It seems he could not carve through these mountains and was forced to leave his chariots behind. That didn't stop him, though. It just meant that he and his whole army was forced to climb over the tops of steep mountains on foot. And when they got to the other side, the defenders who thought their mountains were protect them were horrified to discover that pretty much the entire Assyrian army was on the wrong side of their defenses. Judging from other similar feats, like Alexander the Great in the same region, the infantry probably climbed those mountains with very few supplies, and once the battle was concluded in tiglath pileser's favor, the men likely descended particularly harshly on the civilian food stores and, of course, the civilians in general. The region as a whole is said to end up a heap of ruins, plundered, burned, enslaved, and taxed. Once all this was completed, tiglath pileser went home to enjoy his spoils and had a poem composed in his honor. This is apparently a work of some considerable artistic merit in the original language, but it's not a poem of much thematic subtlety. The part which we can read opens with, The sons of the mountains devised warfare in their hearts. The enemies initiated their war. And later it features a council of gods, which concludes with Asher declaring, Slaughter the enemy, destroy the foe, and stating that slaughter swayed the god's heart. In the poem's telling, Asher created himself this war in order to destroy the enemies, and the gods themselves march alongside the soldiers, with Nusku on the right flank, Adu on the left flank, Ninurta in the center, with the king himself supported by Enlil and Ishtar, here called Ishtar the Lady of Turmoil. Finally, the end result of the war is spelled out quite clearly. Daily, the king inflicts upon them devastation. Their lofty cities he smashes to the last one. From their fields of sustenance he rips out their grain. Fear he has cast upon them, and so forth in that matter. The kings of Assyria wanted everyone to know exactly what they were doing in multiple artistic genres, and they were not competing for any Nobel Peace Prizes. Anyway, returning to his annals, the writer concludes each year with a sort of epitaph, with, the ye with this year reading... Tiglath Pileser, the valiant hero who opens up mountain trails, who subdues the non submissive, who overthrows all that are proud. Presumably, that last line does not include the king himself, who seems in no small part to be proud. And with all this, we can pretty well assume that he has done the most important work of an Assyrian king on a military campaign. He's proven himself in battle, and thus secured his legitimacy on the throne. He brought back a bunch of treasure, notably copper from the mines of the northern mountains, which he can distribute to the wealthy men and priests of Assyria to secure their loyalty more directly. And he's either expanded or re-established control over certain key regions, boosting both glory and the Assyrian economic network. If anyone deserves a rest for a bit, it's tiglath pileser and his hard-working troops. Certainly, his neighbors are glad to see him in Asher instead of on their borders. Except, as the next year rises and the campaign season begins again, the troops are called back up north, because tiglath pileser hasn't burned enough cities with fire. <laughs> 
Now, we've talked at various times about how the armies were organized, and in the past, there have been professional, year-round armies which made their way through Mesopotamia. And it isn't clear when that stopped, or when that may have stopped and started and stopped again, uh, but certainly by this point, the Assyrian army is almost completely a seasonal one. They call men up after the harvest, and then make sure they're back home in time for planting. And this likely includes even the elites of the army at this point. Even if the charioteers aren't necessarily out in the fields doing the planting, they still want to be home on their government-provided lands to oversee their laborers, slaves, and their hired men. Some small corps of bodyguards may serve year-round, living in the palace and eating at the king's expense, but it's also possible that even these were not literally around the king at all times and instead called out at certain times of year. He would have had guards, but that would have been different from the bodyguards. The bodyguards are like an elite among the military. His just regular guards are just guys with sticks keeping anybody from stabbing the king, if that makes sense. Anyway, the harvest season is over, and now it's killing season. And this year, he heads back up into the northwestern mountains. The land of Shubarti, Alzi, and Purukizi are again haughty and non-submissive, and are made submissive in quick succession, using much the same language, indicating that all this talk of devastation is at least somewhat literary. By that I mean Tiglath-Pileser is definitely causing big frowny faces to appear on the people his army passed by. But often the specifics of what happened in a campaign are obscured by overly dramatic language of utter destruction wherever he marches. Remember, these records were meant to be read maybe to the public, at least to the elite, and perhaps more importantly... They were meant to be remembered by future generations. And he's more interested in looking good than telling an accurate and compelling history podcast. So we can safely assume that even if the words being formulaic hides a lot of diversity in what happened in each campaign, the general idea of pillage, burning, slavery, slaughtering, and general misfortune is definitely still going on. Next up, there are some other areas that have been invaded by foreigners. An area of the land of Shubarti has been invaded and occupied by some familiar enemies, the Kaskins, who are working with a group called the Urami, which are apparently some band of warrior refugees from the Hittite Empire itself. Now, these former enemies have teamed up in the chaos of the Bronze Age collapse, to go see what new and interesting ways they can help the Bronze Age collapse even harder, setting up a petty tyranny in a formerly peaceful mountain valley. Was it actually peaceful? Who knows? 4,000 caskins, probably the infantry, and 120 chariots, probably the ex-Hittites, were captured and integrated into the Assyrian army without fighting. It seems that they saw which way the wind was blowing and weren't interested in independence so much as they were interested in violence and plunder. After this unexpected reinforcement, he goes back to Kutmuhi, he being Tiglath-Pileser, and burns all their cities down a second time. This also should give us an indication to what this language really means. We've mentioned it before and we'll see it again, but when these ancient records tell us they completely annihilate a group, that usually just means they defeated someone in battle. Certainly, this city was not happy to be subsequently plundered, and likely a fair bit of burning, slaving, raping, plundering, and murdering occurred, but we should never take claims of total devastation to be the sort of industrial stick ale genocide we've seen in modern eras. Each time, people survive, and if they get a few years of peace, they can slowly rebuild their communities. Of course, this time they've been hit twice, two years in a row. They're probably going to be hurting for a long time to come. 
I mean, no doubt Tiglath Pileser would have undertaken an industrial scale genocide if he had industrial scale tools, but he didn't. By the way, those reading in the biblical book of Joshua should keep in mind that that book is in the exact same genre as these records with all that entails. Anyway, this battle involves more climbing up of impassable mountains, and the year finishes out with another poem, proclaiming Tiglath Pileser as the one who overwhelms the resistance of the wicked. Wicked, in this case, meaning anyone who doesn't preemptively pay tribute to the Assyrian king. And you, dear listener, have you paid tribute to the Assyrian king lately? If not, you should consider yourself very wicked. Next year is much the same as the previous years, though it may have been faster and more restrained. He travels into the mountains more northeast, and we hear of him conquering a long list of places, piling corpses on the mountains for the blood to flow in the valleys, but notably we don't hear much about lasting results, just plundering. Perhaps these were never intended as more than raids, or perhaps the resistance was more than he expected, and he simply withdrew rather than spend lives against targets that probably weren't worth the effort. The land of Muratash does have its gods taken, usually a sign of a whole people being brought into captivity, and some of the other lands have taxes imposed on them, but we hear little more of most of them. Anyway, even his own chronicle is clearly getting a bit tired of recording all the tiny tribes being devastated one by one, because the fourth year is what he's clearly interested in discussing. In the fourth year, can you believe it, Tiglath Pileser goes to war again. And this was the big one. He set out a bit north and a lot west, crossing 17 mountains, crossing the upper Euphrates River, carving through valleys where he needed wider roads, cutting down trees where he needed great bridges, and he ended up somewhere in the land of Nairi, which way back in the late Bronze Age had been a contested area between the Hittites and the Assyrians. There is no great Hittite empire to confront him here, but instead 23 local kings unite in common self-defense and are commonly wiped out. 2,000 horses are taken, an invaluable booty from a place famous for horses in that era, as are slaves and more normal forms of wealth, including one donkey load of magnesium every year. This last may have been used in super fancy glass making or as a pigment in paints, though there is a possibility that what is meant here is certain minerals which can be natural magnets. We're not 100% sure, it's just one line. Interestingly, the 23 kings are all brought into a temple of Shamash, made to bow down and swear an oath of fealty, and then are allowed to return home. However, one king gets a bit of special treatment, getting taken all the way to Asher itself for his religious ceremony, though whether he's a particularly stubborn, stubborn king or if he's more prestigious, it's hard to say. Now, it can be hard to tell in this swirl of names, many of which even dedicated historians can't identify, so don't worry if you're having trouble keeping up with all these names, but this fourth year campaign is the most successful and impressive of all the ones recorded in this chronicle. Probably our biggest indication that this was his primary campaign is that in year five, he seems to not want to go out on campaign at all. He s returns to Asher, he settles in, and if he hadn't been attacked by Arameans, he probably would have stayed in his palace all year. Now this, this is the first historical reference to the people who will come to be massively influential. The fifth year of Tiglath Placer. Now the short version of this is you can think of them as quite a bit like the Amorites way back in the Bronze Age and even the Akkadians before that. 
The Aramaeans are a group of Western Semitic nomads, possibly a group from among the Ahlamu that we've seen so much of, or perhaps a parallel group. The civilized people of the Near East were either not super clear on where they came from, or they just didn't care. They're going to enter the region sometimes through violence and often through peaceful integration until a substantial cultural replacement has occurred. And this is going to be a difficult story to tell in a coherent way because from what I can see, the Aramaeans just sort of pop up from time to time, first in records of wars and later in economic records, but no one really saw the Aramaeans entering the region. One day they're raiders from the outside, another day they're just people like everyone else, and the next day they'd become so pervasive that the Aramean language had become the standard language of the entire region. For context, this is the same Aramean language which Jesus would have spoken from day to day, not because Jesus was special, but because a thousand years after Tiglath-Pileser's first skirmishes, the Arameans will have become so integrated into Near Eastern civilization as to have their influence absolutely everywhere. Now, the texts we're reading on this show are going to pretty much stay Akkadian in one of its various dialects, pretty much through the end of the Babylonian Empire. It'll be in the Persian Empire that written Aramean starts to become a major thing, often to the detriment of historians. You see, Aramean had the advantage that it was much easier to write than the cuneiform languages, and easier than Egyptian hieroglyphics, and also the advantage that it was meant to be written on ink, on papyrus or leather or other cheap, lightweight materials. And this was great. I mean, there's a reason we don't write on clay tablets anymore. There's, there's a bunch of reasons. But it does mean that the materials that Aramaic things were written on decomposed much faster and mostly don't survive until today. This means that it's really hard to tell just how much was actually written in Aramaic in the pre-Persian period because early Aramaic writings mostly all decomposed while Akkadian clay tablets have survived. It also makes it real hard to say how Aramean language started to rise, because all those early... we Normally, we'd look at, oh, there's a few written documents here. Oh, there's more written documents at this later period. Oh, there's a lot of written documents at this later period. And we'd see, oh, it's the rise of Aramaic writing. But that entire... That entire historical uh, data set is just gone. Anyway, the point of all this is that we're going to be keeping our eyes on the Aramaeans for a while, even though we often won't have much to say about them. The long-term importance of these people is hard to understate, but their full story is also hard to understand, thanks to that paucity of records. Mostly what we get about them in the early period is records of when other kingdoms had to go to war with them. And this year is one of those years, the first of those years in the written sources. As mentioned, it seems likely that Tiglath-Pileser was planning to relax, or if not r actually relax, at least focus on domestic policies. But rather late in the year, a bunch of Arameans invaded for no reason. Well, not for no reason. It's theorized that there may have been a slow and slight climactic shift over these centuries, which negatively impacted agriculture around the region. By one estimate, if we look at the region nowadays, when the average annual temperature rises by about 1 degree Celsius, near eastern rainfall falls by about 3 centimeters over that year. Now, this may not sound like a lot, but for an already very arid region, that can make a substantial difference in the regions which are climactic transition zones. And it can lower the water level of the Tigris and Euphrates quite substantially, as they're largely fed by snow melt in the mountains. And a year with less snow, both because of higher temperatures and lower precipitation, is going to be felt all the way downstream.
Now, we mentioned this climactic shift in the context of the decline and collapse of the settled Near Eastern powers in the centuries after 1200, but of course, the climate affects everybody, including nomads. And nomadic groups don't just sit back and decline when things are going bad. They set out to go raid their neighbors more often and more aggressively to make up for what they can't grow and raise peacefully. Now, why the Aramaeans happened to be on top of all the other tribes in this period is unknown and possibly unknowable. But the short entry for this year in tiglath Placer's Chronicle is interesting both for how typical it is and for the few details that will prove to be all too typical. With the help of Asher, my lord, I led forth my chariots and warriors and went into the desert, into the midst of the Halamu, the Aramaeans, enemies of Asher, my lord, I marched the country from Suhi to the city of Karchemish, in the land of Hatti, I raided in one day. I slew their troops, their spoil, their goods, and their possessions in countless numbers I carried away. The rest of their forces, which had fled from before the terrible weapons of Asher, my lord, had crossed the Euphrates. In pursuit of them, I crossed the Euphrates in vessels made of skins. Six of their cities, which lay at the foot of the mountain of Beshir, I captured. I burned with fire. I laid them waste. I destroyed them. Their spoil, their goods, and their possessions, I carried away to my city, Asher. So we hear about a bunch of cities being destroyed and raided. Note, interestingly, that already, barely a century after the fall of the Hittite Empire, it is the area of Syria that's now considered the land of the Hittites, though we'll be covering that transition a bit later. But he hits a bunch of cities, none of which are necessarily Aramean cities. The ethnic map of Syria is really hard to be sure of at this point. They could have all been under Aramean vassalship or occupation for this particular year, or they could have been mostly innocent bystanders, or anything in between. But what we can probably reconstruct here is that the Arameans attacked Assyrian lands. tiglath pileser came out at full speed to chase them off, and they immediately fled beyond his reach rather than stay and fight. He either built or commandeered some simple boats to chase them across the Euphrates, but these are no civilized enemy with an established capital and king. Now, the, the, tiglath pileser was a civilized enemy with an established capital, and as king he could hardly go back home with nothing but a fistful of sand slipping through his fingers. And so he raided a bunch of cities who, let's be honest, may or may not have been somehow affiliated with the Aramaeans before returning home. A frustrating, though minor, chapter in tiglath pileser's reign, though one pregnant with historical significance for what comes later. His sixth year, the final year for our super detailed chronicle is another extremely bloody foray into the northern mountains, this time against the Musri and the Kumani. This campaign will again see the full sweep of Assyrian foreign policy, from the cities which simply surrender at the reputation of tiglath pileser to cities which resist so bitterly that they're razed utterly, their ruins cursed by the gods, and their fields salted. Yet even though this is some of his fiercest fighting in the early years, neither the Kumani nor the Musri are completely defeated, and will both show up again in the future to make more problems for the Northern Empire. All that, and we're only six years into the reign of tiglath pileser It has been significant, with a number of important shifts which we'll see again and again, but subsequent years are less well documented, so we can expect them to go a bit quicker. Next time, we're going to finish up tiglath pileser's reign and move surprisingly quickly from this impressive era of expansion to a series of successors who will struggle to maintain what's been built. Now, we're still a good two centuries from what historians usually call the start of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, and we've got quite a lot of muddling through before we get there. <laughs>
Of course, that muddling will have quite a lot of violence, so if you like violence, join us next time as we look at more Assyrian violence, as well as some of the nice stuff they built at home with all that bloody plunder. Thank you for listening.